can reflect on. Ich möchte euch wieder ermutigen, Notizen zu machen. Ihr müsst nicht unbedingt viel aufschreiben, aber schreibt euch was auf, damit ihr nochmal die Sachen euch vorbeiziehen lasst. Uh, in the first 10 years of having these conferences, we always gave a stiff examination at the end of the conference. In den ersten 10 Jahren, in denen wir diese Konferenzen hatten, haben wir am Ende der Konferenzen immer ein Examen gehabt. And some who failed that exam uh, were not able to go to the field they were wanting to go to. Und einige, die das Examen dann nicht bestanden haben, die konnten nicht in das Feld gehen, in das Einsatzgebiet gehen, wo sie eigentlich hingehen wollten. Well, as we got more and more people, these exams, uh, nobody wanted to grade them. Als wir dann mehr und mehr Leute bekamen, da wollte niemand das Examen durchsehen. And so that vision uh, somehow disappeared. Und irgendwie, uh, verschwand dieses Anliegen, diese Vision. But we hope this will be a time of uh, seriously studying some of the basic principles of the Word of God. Tonight I want to share on dealing with failure in your Christian life. I've had a lot of experience in this area. And I'm sure the boss and the secretary that we just watched also are in need of this message. I want you to turn to 2 Samuel and chapter 12. Here we have another glimpse of David. I listened to Peter Maiden's message on cassette tape that he shared on moral purity during the summer conferences. And that was a great challenge, a great message. Und das war eine großartige Botschaft. But I want to just read the scripture a little further to another incident connected with this sin. Aber ich möchte diese Schrift, die Schrift noch etwas weiterlesen um, zu, einem anderen, zu einer anderen Begebenheit. When David was praying uh, for his child, als David für sein Kind betet, nämlich. We find in verse 15, we'll read starting at verse 15. In verse 15, lesen wir dann. Let me just get that. If you'll just bear with me a minute, I'd rather read it from this translation. 2 Samuel uh, 12, 15. 2 Samuel 12, verse 15. So Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, so that he was sick, very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child, and David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead, since he might do himself harm? But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Verse 20, if you're following in another language. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes and he came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and when he requested they set food before him and he ate. Then his servant said to him, 
What is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, what a, what a nugget of truth. And he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. What an amazing uh, lesson from the Word of God. Some people may ask why God even allows uh, these things to be recorded in the Word of God. This terrible sin of David with Bathsheba. If you made a movie of it, it would be classified as pornography. And yet it's recorded there in the Word of God. And then we have this story of judgment after the sin with Bathsheba. In which God judged David's family and allowed that child to die. David did not want that. Have you ever wanted something with all the depth of your soul that you would even fast and pray and cry out to God many times for it? That is the experience of David. And he fasted and he would not eat and he, he laid prostrate before God. Then when he received the news that the child was dead, instead of breaking out with grief or with anger or with rage, as people often do when this kind of tragedy hits their home, we find David worshiping God. David worshipped God. And then he went and he took some food and he changed his clothes. Und dann ging er, aß etwas und wechselte seine Kleider. Something that we, I hope, will never forget. Etwas, von dem ich denke, dass wir es nie vergessen werden. Uh, when failure comes hard upon us. Dass wenn Versagen uns hart trifft. And everything uh, seems to be going wrong. Und alles auch verkehrt zu gehen scheint. There is the need for worship. Dann of course, David had already repented of the sin. Peter shared with you that part of the scripture. When Nathan uh, said in verse 7, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. Du bist der Mann, so spricht der Herr, der Gott Israels. Ich habe dich zum König gesalbt über Israel und ich habe dich errettet aus der Hand Sauls. And of course, David finally realized his sin. Und David sah dann seine Sünde schlussendlich ein. Notice verse 10. Vers 10. Because of this sin, judgment was to come upon his house. Wegen dieser Sünde soll Gericht über sein Haus kommen. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Uriah, 
David, uh, of course, responded in verse 13. In verse 13, antwoordde David dan. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sins. Ye shall not die. Sprach David zu Nathan, Ich habe gesündigt gegen den Herrn. Nathan sprach zu David, So hat auch der Herr deine Sünde weggenommen. Du wirst nicht sterben. Now remember, this man was the king of Israel. And he was God's anointed man. We make a big mistake in the church of Jesus Christ today. If we don't think that anointed men commit great sin. If you don't think that can happen, you don't know the Bible, you don't know history, and maybe you need to go back to spiritual first grade and try reading, starting from Genesis. God is calling his people unto holiness. And that is our goal. We, of course, now have far more truth than David had. And we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And there's passages in Corinthians that indicate that we should be learning. We should be learning from these terrible things that happened in the Old Testament. And in Corinthians it talks about so many who fell into the sin of fornication even on one day. Maybe we could just turn quickly to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Talks about all the sin that came into Israel even in the wilderness, even after they had been set free from Egypt. They were, these were the people of God. These were the people that had seen the miracles. Some people say to me, if we only had more miracles today, that would resolve the problems in the church. I don't think that's the case. In fact, some of the churches that I have been to where they've had the greatest miracles, within three years they've had the greatest immorality and the greatest number of pregnancies. These people had seen the great miracles in Egypt. They had a great deliverance through the Red Sea. And yet, what does it say in verse 8 of chapter 10? Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 23,000 in one day. Now we have a situation in America today because the church is so big and many churches are so lukewarm that we can say, unfortunately, that hundreds of men of God are falling into fornication. Now we don't have a situation like the children of Israel. They're not all on one team <laughs> or one church, so it's not noticed. And we're dealing with a nation where there may be 30 or 40 million uh, believers or Christians. Nobody knows. Maybe it's 20 million. I've heard statistics about China. Some say there are 20 million believers. Some say there are 10 million. Some say 50 million. 
And recently a lady came out of China and she says she believes there's 100 million believers in China. If there are, it's far more Christian uh, than, than, than the United States. Uh, most people would put the figure nowhere, nowhere above 50 million. So in these countries where there are many, many Christians, uh, this statistic, you know, it's not so bad. But I believe if we don't stand out and speak out, it's going to get far worse. One man of God says he believes in some countries immorality in the church. In the church is an epidemic stage. Isn't it amazing how the Bible talks about these things? I love the honesty of the Bible. You know what ministered me to me the most in the meeting so far? The honesty of our sister Ricky to stand before hundreds of you and confess that she had a struggle, fear of evangelism. That, that, that stuck out. And everything that's been said up to, up to now here, that's stuck in my mind. And I hope that you're moving on that highway of honesty in these days. And that you're not trying to hide, even from the people who interview you, maybe you want to go to this particular country, and so the temptation is to hide something about your life that you think may hinder you from being accepted in that country that you want to go to so, so much. God is trying to build a foundation in your life. God's not yet putting the antenna on your roof. God's building the foundation. And during this first week, we try to emphasize some of the foundation truths. We know for some of you, you've heard these things already. Let me just share a little bit now about how to deal with failure. First of all, we've seen that if it's sin, we deal with it by repenting. Not all failure is sin. If I make a mistake driving my car, my car, and I hit a tree, I don't think the first thing I should do is get out of the car and get on my face and repent. Now, if I was driving too fast, if I was purposely, uh, knowingly, uh, you know, rebelling against the rules and against advice, doing something foolish, then I would, I would, uh, I would repent. I do it very quickly uh, and then try to see if anybody else was hurt and uh, try to take some practical steps. It's a tremendous thing to be able to uh, to avoid panic when, when, when failure comes. That's not always so easy. We like to all believe that we, you know, we're going to keep our cool when things are going wrong. 
I haven't always done that in my life. And I was ministered to by this little quotation I'm going to share with you. It's good for some of us in Operation Mobilization. If you are able to keep your head when everyone else is losing theirs, with, with speaking philosophically, a very famous expression in English, If you are able to keep your head when everyone else is losing theirs, perhaps you have not yet understood the problems. <laughs> That maybe just bring into balance what many of us have been, you know, listening to for years by the hyper idealists. <laughs> So not all failure is sin, but generally most sin has an element of failure. Again, language is very important. We might try to translate what I've just said into another language and it, it, it wouldn't make sense. Because in their language, maybe some tribe that's just being given a written language, the word for failure and the word for sin may be the same. That's not true in English. What about in German? It's not true in German. But it may be true in your mind. So that you're not able to distinguish between failures that come as a result of your human weakness or just a mistake and sin. And that is a dangerous area, lack of discernment. So you get people repenting of things that you don't need to repent of. You don't think you should repent when you fail an exam. Oh God, I have sinned against you in failing this examination. Now it becomes complicated because, of course, if you haven't studied it all, because you're lazy and you haven't been just fooling around, then you need to repent of laziness and lack of discipline. Well, David knew. David knew his was a big failure and a big sin. And so he faced it and he repented. You can read Psalm 51. And then he was willing to face the consequences of that sin. Now he beseeched God that the child would be spared. But when the judgment of God fell and that child died, David worshipped. And I want to recommend that as one of the greatest ways you can bounce back from sin or failure in your life. He worshipped God. He lifted his heart in praise to God, acknowledging the sovereignty of God. Brother Dale gave a great message to us in our general council. At the sovereignty of God. And realizing that God to varying degrees controls that which comes into the life of the believer. 
Then after David worshipped, he took some practical steps to get himself back into condition. Und dann, nachdem David angebetet hatte, da unternahm er einige praktische Schritte, um sich selbst wieder ins alltägliche Leben einzugliedern. David arose from the ground, he washed, verse 20, he anointed himself, he changed his clothes, and he came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house when he, when he requested that, set be food before him, and he ate. Dann stand David von der Erde auf und wusch sich, salbte sich und zog andere Kleider an, ging in das Haus des Herrn und betete an, und uh, er tat es, was er fragte. Seemingly, there was no more self-pity, no more resentment, no more bitterness. In fact, Buck Singh, in his famous book about David, calls the book David Recovered All. Buck Singh, in his famous book about David, says, David brachte alles wieder. How I remember when our brother Buck Singh was ministering right here at this conference in Belgium some years ago. This man moving toward 90 years of age has been a great example of perseverance and spiritual reality. And he's Buck Singh had many, many failures in his early Christian life. Among other things, he had a great speech impediment. And it's amazing to see how God takes weak earthen vessels and uses them for his glory. One of the things I learned from working with Buck Singh of India was that he knew how to plow through failure. He knew how to bounce back from failure and from difficulties, especially in the church. I was with him when one of his leading men in one of his churches had just committed suicide. Can you imagine what that would be for a Christian leader to suddenly discover that one of his faithful men, his church planters, his pastors, had just committed suicide? Can you imagine what that would be for a Christian leader to suddenly discover that one of his faithful men, his church planters, his pastors, had just committed suicide? A few years ago, Northern Ireland was shaken when one of the most godly Christian leaders in Northern Ireland committed suicide. A few years ago, in another Bible college, a mighty man of prayer that I knew for many years committed suicide. This is just the opposite of what David did. And most suicides among Christian leaders are based on the inability to bounce back after tremendous sin or failure has entered the Christian life. Seems to me this is a good lesson we should learn when we're young. Sin and failure is not the end of the road. And we need to write that well in the tables of our hearts during these days. Just to bring this to a close, what are a few other practical things that will help us deal with failure? I've wrestled a lot with failure in my life. No, not the big, not the big scandalous failures that would bring a lot of 
you know, a lot of hardship to Operation Mobilization, a lot of gossip. But you see, my, my first concern isn't what men think. My first concern is what does God think? And I have failed God many times. I have sinned against God many times. Maybe with the eyes, maybe with the tongue. Many mighty men of God like Murray McChain from Scotland. Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, David Brainerd, David Brainerd. William Carey, we can name many others. The closer they got to God, the more they saw the sinfulness and the wretchedness of their own lives and their own hearts. So you know when you start seeing your own sinfulness. Though of course you hate sin. You might want to have a little secret rejoicing that perhaps it's a sign that you're getting closer to Jesus. Not to excuse the sin. But to realize God is doing something in your life. Now at this point, of course, it's important to understand there's a great difference between temptation and sin. And you may think, oh, George Verwer is a great Christian leader. He, he, he's not talking about sin. He's talking about temptation. That's what problem he has. Now, let, let, let's just make it clear. Just that. I have both. Temptation. And sometimes there's victory. Then there's temptation. And due to my own stubbornness, my own weakness, my own whatever. There's not the victory. Especially if I follow God's standard of holiness. Because God's word teaches, for example, that in all that we say, we should be kind and loving, esteeming the other better than ourselves. So, if something unkind comes from my mouth to my wife, that is a sin. That's a sin against God. And as you get in more and more into the New Testament, and more and more about the Spirit-filled life, you're going to become sensitive about your sins. As a young Christian, I became oversensitive to my sins. And it almost completely destroyed me. I cannot explain to you how hungry I was for revival and holiness and, and, and what I thought as biblical perfection when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years of age. And I got into some very subtle extremism. And if I hadn't been brought into balance by certain scriptures and by certain people and by certain uh, books, I, I wouldn't be here today. And I know some of you who are here. You're very sensitive about sin. I know some of you are perpetually feeling guilty because you're not winning all the battles against lust. Why don't you be honest? Ich weiß, dass einige von euch sich dauernd, andauernd schuldig fühlen, weil es zum Beispiel, nur zum Beispiel, 
Others are feeling perpetually guilty because they're not winning regularly the battles against the sins of the tongue. Or against resentment, or bitterness, or jealousy, or unkindness. There's a whole range of areas where most of us are having some difficulty. The enemy is the accuser of the brethren. He has a campaign to convince you absolutely that you're no good, you'll certainly never be a missionary, and probably you better not even go on Operation Mobilization for one year. And you may have the false idea that some of these leaders who are sharing with you, we're all living way up here, and, and you're living way down here. Because you know what the Bible says about the sin that causes more more trouble than any other sin. Pride. Pride. That's why there are many spirit-filled men who today are no longer walking with God. That's why that great forerunner of the American charismatic movement a man who I will I'll not mention his name it is now a false cult named after him. He exercised more miraculous power than any man living in America at that time. He had all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. He could attract 20,000 people as fast as I could attract six. He had the most unbelievable range of incredible healings. As he got a little older, he denied the Lord Jesus Christ as part of the member of the Trinity. And of course, split that whole movement into many, many fragments, his own movement. And then he died. <laughs> and today we're left behind with one more cult. They're in, they're in India, they're in Switzerland, they're in England, they're not too big. No need to mention the name. I wonder if we could really come to grips with this message we find here in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And determine in our lives, no matter what failure, no matter what sin comes in, and of course we don't want any of it, we are going to bounce back if it happens. Learn to see the big picture when you feel that you have failed. The sovereignty of God. Romans 8.28 All things can work out together for good for those who love God. When I have a failure or sin, Satan tries to magnify it. And it helps me to get back to a place of stability by looking at the big picture. The big picture. All of life is ahead of you. And as you bounce back now, as you refuse discouragement, 
you will experience God's grace. And years later, you'll look back at that failure. And you'll have a good laugh. And you'll have a good praise to God. That uh, he can turn even failure around and somehow use it as a stepping stone to success. If you failed an exam and therefore you're not going on for further education, but as instead you've come on Operation Mobilization, you don't have to be ashamed of that. You don't have to be ashamed of that. Durch ein Examen geraten bist und uh, nicht uh, weiter, weiter gemacht hast mit deiner Ausbildung und stattdessen zu UN gekommen bist, du brauchst dich darum nicht schämen. There's a small group of people praying that, that people will fail exams. Es gibt eine kleine Gruppe, die dafür betet, dass Leute durch Examen fallen. God's providence. Also Gottes Vorsehungsgeheimnis. If you're here and you discover you don't have 100% totally pure motive mainly a passion for souls and a love for world evangelism. There won't be any angel moving around in the prayer meeting clobbering you on the head for mixed motives. You're a human being. When will we grow up and accept our humanity in the midst of all of our spirituality and all of our spiritual books and all of our high-sounding songs and language? What a divine balance we need. And I'll tell you, many of these great men of God that I've had a privilege of knowing, they have found that balance in their lives, and that's why they're still going on tonight. Now, we're going to go to prayer in a few minutes. And I'm getting keyed up for the prayer meeting. But if someone comes to me and says there's a sizzling, warm, hot pizza from the Pizza Hut waiting in your bus, then I'm going to the bus first. You see, a character like me can pray anytime, but I can't get pizza over here hardly any time. And you know, we've seen through some of the super spirituality that has run through OM in years gone by, we've seen Phariseeism, judgmentalism, and many other ugly things in this movement. And in the early days, we got some of our women into a position where they could not even spend money without feeling guilt feelings. If you don't think something is ugly, well, then I don't know what, the way you think. The big picture. Another thing that helps me is to realize we're all failures. I've been emphasizing that, so I'm going to move on to the third thing. It's about life and about men and women of God. Especially when we're legalists. And without a constant bath in the grace of God when you're in OM, you will be destined to become a legalist. Another thing I'd just like to mention is, of course, my many, own, many of my own personal experiences. I've shared enough of that. Another thing that helps us face failure 
we realize there's often a blessing just around the corner. Just around the corner. Like when I came back from the Soviet Union after that great literature campaign that completely failed. And went into the mountains and got this uh, further understanding and this, this name, Operation Mobilization. Learn not to panic. Worship Jesus instead. Maybe you want to go to this particular country. You want to go to the ship. You've been praying about being on the ship ever since you were a little girl. We've had the ship for 15 years, so there are people who have prayed for it when they were little, and now they're actually going to go on the ship. And when they, they get their interview, I don't know how the ship people communicate all this. Maybe you get a little note. You are accepted for the ship project. Report to room 6,245. What if you get a little note? You're there praying. God's just... You just feel so filled with joy because you've heard a rumor that you've been accepted and oh, you're just praising God. And the note comes through your post box. We appreciated the fellowship with you. But we are unable to accept you for the ship ministry. We recommend ICT. How would you handle that situation? Of course, you would just be praising God, right? God's providence. Now you could always appeal. Let me just give you a little pointer. You can always appeal the decision. You can, you can run to Dale Rotan. And just fall down on his feet crying and weeping. Pounding your breasts. And I can assure you, you will get nowhere. <laughs> How important it is to be able to deal, not just with failure, but with disappointments when they come into our lives. And I'll tell this to those of you who will be accepted for the ship. That after you get there, it may, for some of you, prove to be the greatest disappointment in your Christian life. And that can be true of India, it can be true of ICT, it can be true of our China ministry, which we don't have, it can be true of anything. I've had many disappointments in my life, but I have seen that often what is a disappointment is often God's appointment for something better for me in the long run. Well, there's a few ideas of how to deal with failure. How to bounce back. How to keep on keeping on no matter what happens in your spiritual life. Probably most of us will never face that tremendous failure that David faced in his, in his leadership. And that's one of the reasons it's one of the reasons we have it in the Word of God. But if you ever do, if you ever do,
I pray that you will remember this night and know that no failure, no sin in the life of a believer is the end of the road. And if he is a true believer, even if somehow he is judged or something happens in which he dies at that moment, he still, because of God's mercy and sovereignty and the blood of Christ, goes into the presence of the living God. That should bring much joy and much praise to our hearts. We are kept by his love. It's not your perseverance, but his keeping power that makes this whole Christian life work. So let's do as David for the rest of our life. When there's a problem or a sin or a failure or a disappointment when he lost that baby. Let us worship. And then let's change our clothes. Have a little to eat. And get back on the road of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for this tremendous challenge from the life of David and his his dealing with deep sin and failure in his own life. Lord, in this coming year, teach us much about how to deal with failure. And also how to reach out when other people have failed. And to be more understanding and more kind and considerate in all that we say, in all that we think. We praise you for this great salvation. We thank you that your blood, Lord Jesus, cleanses from all sin. We thank you for the divine factor at work in our lives by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the human factor. That this treasure is in an earthen vessel. And by your grace we will accept our humanity as well as your divinity. Help us, O oh God, to find balance and reality in these areas. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your eyes upon Let us worship him.